This is the Bethel Business Podcast, brought to you by the Bethel Chamber of Commerce in Bethel, Connecticut, and produced by Smith Douglas Associates. Welcome to the Bethel Business Podcast. We are here at Bird's Books with Alice Hutchinson. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Bird's Books. How did Bird's Books come around? What what made you decide to open a bookstore in Bethel? It's a little bit of a story. Uh, my mother had owned a bookstore in Westport for 30 years. It was a new age bookstore called Pymander Bookshop, and many people I have discovered still remember it fondly. My sister had opened it. My mother bought it for my sister and started her version of the store at 55 years old and sold it when she was 84. So she sold it to a woman who moved it to Westport. But while I worked for my mother, I worked for her seasonally. I did some of her book buying. I um, started her music department. And it gave me a toe into how to buy for a bookstore, some of those vital skills, as well as bringing my children up around a book culture. Fast forward, when I was married with two little kids and Barnes & Noble was taking applications out of a trailer, I was on the opening team. So we put bookshelves together. We built the whole bookstore from the ground up. But I got an opportunity to work for corporate book selling, which is completely different than independent book selling. Uh, you don't do any of the ordering. You don't do any make any of the choices. But you do have to know the inventory and you still have to match that to the person. It was also a very heady era when there was about four times the inventory as they have now and about three times the number of employees. And so it was the height of the book culture. Fast forward, I went through several other iterations, but when borders closed and I found myself in a position where I could make some choices and where I was to go next, I found that there was a huge gap that borders left. So I approached Wendy Cahill, who owns Bolton Java, who was moving over to the Victorian where she now is in Dolan Plaza, and asked her what her plans were for the second floor. And she said, well, I'm really looking for a bookstore. And I said, fancy that. I said, how many square feet? And it was only 450 square feet, but I figured it might be enough to find out if the community was able to support a brick-and-mortar bookstore because my experience in book selling was pre-Amazon, was pre-online ordering. And I knew the impact that Amazon had had, and Amazon, of course, is here to stay. But I wanted to know in real time, in, in present terms, whether a bookstore was viable. So we started there, and it was viable enough that I went from 450 square feet after 18 months to the present location, which is 1,300 square feet, and we have been, we opened in 2011, and this December will be our sixth year. So we really reset the bar about two, about a year and a half in. So we're now just hitting our stride as a new business. Uh, we've sort of figured out what our customers are looking for, what we want to do, because any bookstore is a reflection of the owner. I bought the store I want to shop in. So sometimes I have to stretch outside my boundaries to subject matter or genres that I don't know that much about. So I ask for help. I have a book group that is tremendously helpful. But I think the real reason I wanted to open this store here was I felt that Bethel as a community needed it. Not only did I need it, because I really wanted the expression of literacy, the opportunity for children to keep reading, the opportunity for adults to have access to books that wasn't a corporate environment. I wanted the community of book selling and book buying to be in Bethel. And I felt strongly that I could offer something that was unique and that was valuable. So far, so good. We have been close to the line a couple times, uh, mostly in the last year when everybody sort of took a dip from buying anything in general. The retail market sort of hit the fan right after the first of the year. But we spoke to our colleagues and everyone else was riding it out. So we had the, the support to keep doing that. So we opened here and I'm very, I'm very happy and I feel very fortunate to be in Bethel. What are your favorite kind of books to surround yourself with? Personally, I love historical fiction. I love the history, and I like fictional characters dropped into that history. Because often, if it, particularly if it's exceptionally well-written, 
like All the Light We Cannot See, you find out a little bit more history through the eyes of a fictional character. And someone who is a good historian that writes that brings a unknown corner of history to life. And I, I really like it. We've made jokes in my book group that we ought to start a World War II historical fiction group just because so many of us like it. But again, that's my personal favorite. What I'm finding out of the favorites here is quite an interesting mix. Not only is historical fiction popular, conventional history is very popular. We tend to be science nerds, so we get an awful lot of how things work kind of things for adults, not just children. So that, that particular section does very well. Nature section does very well. It includes ecology and, and animals. And after the, sort of the best sellers, our next biggest section in terms of popularity is ages 9 to 12. That age group is still reading quite a bit and ages 4 to 8. So we have begun to kind of carve a niche that doesn't include corporate book selling because some of those, particularly the series, tend to be really populist, popular kind of books. And we don't need to duplicate a store that is in the next municipality. So we've made a real point of getting independent authors, popular authors that have series that may or may not make the cut to Barnes & Noble because they're just a little bit outside their wheelhouse when it's a niche for us, because we can heavily curate the really good writing. And then as we get to know the series, we can custom suggest it to children. And so far, it's a good match for everyone. You're very active in the community. You have a lot of things here, including book groups and author signings. What else do you do to bring people into the store? Well, actually, since you mentioned events, events really is the biggest. Once in a while, we'll take an event off-site, particularly if it's chef-related. We'll go into a restaurant and do an event there. We advertise in local papers. We advertise in digitals. We are going to move forward with a new idea where we open up the back third of, of the main room and over the holiday season, we will sublet to certain crafters that want space because they can't go outside anymore or the craft shows aren't available to them. So it will allow us to bring in new populations and add to our contact list. It'll add to our Facebook page. And those actually have been the most successful ways for us to reach out is through our constant contact list and our Facebook page. And in our constant contact list, we provide uh, what's new, we provide what the latest book group is reading. We provide events. We provide links to the events to register. It's newsy. It is informative. And it's really the, the central way that we can get the word out since Bethel doesn't have a little private newspaper anymore. The way to have people find out about things is digitally now. And so we work pretty hard to, to get the word out. But we are events driven. And you're very active on social media, I see. I try. I try. Do you find that brings in people from outside the area? Of course. Uh, one of the features that Facebook has for a business is to boost an event. Uh, so for a meager amount of money, you can extend your reach beyond your list to people in the area. And for every new person, it makes a huge difference in an independent bookstore. One thing that I'd really like to sort of convey to people is unlike the corporate bookstores that are buying hundreds, if not thousands, of copies of a certain book, we buy a dozen at most. And for us to discount, we discount to our email list. We provide coupons and incentives to people on our email list. So between that and the fact that our online sales are 20% off and 99 cents a piece shipping, that's how we can compete with online sales elsewhere. I think people need to remember what they're doing in their community when they shop downtown. And that's really the message that I want to make sure that people understand about a downtown is any open storefront you see is the direct result of online sales. So for everyone who comes in and spends maybe a dollar more for a book or makes the extra trip downtown, or comes in here or spreads the word, it is hugely impactful to me and the other downtown businesses 
when people pay attention and they focus on their downtown. It's not a small thing. Is if you want the bookstore, you need to buy at the bookstore. Some people just like the idea of a bookstore downtown. Buy a book a year or more, and it will keep us going. For people who tend to just think, oh, I'll just order at Amazon, you can place custom orders as well. Oh, we do a large portion of our business as special orders. And I'm really glad you mentioned that. There's two ways to special order from us. One is order a book for store delivery or order a book for home delivery. And the home delivery, as I said before, is 20% off and 99 cents a piece shipping. So if it's a big, you know, art book or something like that, it, you really save quite a bit. For in-store delivery, we place our orders at least every Sunday and they come in on Tuesday. So it's not as if you have to wait. I think it does retrain your brain to realize that we're small, so we can't have everything. We try and have what's new, but if we don't have it, we can get it very easily for you. I'm assuming if someone comes in and says, what do you recommend? That's another benefit of coming to a smaller independent bookstore. Absolutely. Uh, usually my first question is, what's the last book you read you loved? And the other good question is, what kind of book are you looking for? Because they may have read a fiction book that they love, but they're looking for something that's nonfiction or based on a certain theme that they're looking for. So usually there's a couple questions a couple of recommendations. Some people absolutely adore just cuddling up with a big book, you know, like uh, Donna Tartt's Goldfinch, or they really want to read something light and beachy and doesn't tax your brain too much. So it depends on what kind of mood they're in. Sometimes they alternate genres. If they put their name in our computer system when they purchase the book, we have a free frequent buyers program. So after a certain amount of money, you get $10 off your next sale. And it's just, it, you don't have to pay to join it like Barnes & Noble. It's just automatically tracked here. So people come in and go, I can't remember whether I own this book. We can look it up in their customer file and tell them that, we've, that you've already gotten it. Or your son Johnny already has number nine in that series, which you're waiting for is number 10. So some of that is some of the benefit of small bookstores. But... Really, it's getting to know your customers, getting to know what they like to read. Sometimes you actually buy on their behalf. So what kind of events do you have in store? The, the one we're having tonight, as a matter of fact, and by the time this is broadcast, mm. it'll be over. But Eric Offgang teaches at Western Connecticut State University, and he's just come out with a book called Gillette Castle. And it's the history and the background and some of the stories surrounding Gillette Castle. And I can't wait to see it. Sometimes I read the book in advance so that I can be prepared. And sometimes I save it so I hear the talk. And then when I read the book, it comes alive for me. So we have a number of people signed up tonight. We can usually fit anywhere between, you know, we've had a group as small as half a dozen up to 40 people. But generally our, our book presentations are between 10 and 30 you know, that seems to be a comfortable size for us. So he's going to be here. Chris Cook, who teaches also at Western, has come out with a book on compassion, on how to live in compassion, how to be successful in a compassionate life. He's going to be here in September, and I'm really looking forward to that because he did a presentation at the Association of Religious Communities, but he's going to come here and, and hit a different audience, which I, I think is exciting. Melanie Barnum is coming up, and she is a psychic who has a family practice in Ridgefield and has come out with a new book. We are potentially developing a big event over at La Zingara Restaurant uh, around the corner from us with a woman named Camille Aubrey, who has written a book called Cooking for Picasso. And that would be an evening in September that would include the book and the meal for $50, all-inclusive, including tax and tip, and then cash bar. And it would, if you got a few people sign up, we use the room that holds 35 people. And if you get a lot of people signed up, we'll use the room that has 70 people. And usually those events are wildly popular because La Zingara has such a great reputation. And so that's one of the other events we're doing. And we have several in the queue for as we move into the fall. Uh, one of the ones I'm really particularly excited about that I haven't posted yet because it just came together yesterday is our holiday event. We have a book coming up for our birthday party. Now, last year we had a cookie bake-off with Dory Greenspan and her Dory's Cookies. This year, 
It is a blogger who has a book. It's a baking book. It's a how-to baking book. And she is going to have, we're going to do it much like last year, where you buy the book and it comes out in October. If you come to the event and bake, you get a $20 gift certificate to spend in the store. You don't have to, but you can. You can still come to the event anyway. We will also provide boxes that you can buy for $10 for you to take baked goods home in. And that $10 is a donation to the animal shelter here in town, Dawes, Danbury Animal Welfare Society. So what we did last year is the author got a chance to taste her baked goods made by normal people, not some chef in a bakery, not really just tested on the fly in the road, on the road. We had 26 people bake last year. So we had 26 people bake. We had more that just came and bought boxes and took things home. But we get commentary on how you can better improve this or whether this is good for this reason. So the author will be here to do that on Sunday, December 10th. So look for details on that because I'm very excited about it. And that's usually our holiday. And it's two nights before Hanukkah and about a week and a half before Christmas. So what we did last year is I stuck my cookies in the freezer. And when I went to somebody's house for dinner, I brought fresh cookies of a selection made by a whole bunch of people. So it was a great way to get baked goods into your house to either keep, eat, or take with you or do whatever. So it's a, that's the kind of fun event we like to do. We really love it. How many book groups do you have? Right now, we only have two. We have our regular book group that meets the third Thursday of the month. And those genres change monthly. But that's also a drop-in book club. So if you want to talk about a book that you've read that we are talking about, you are welcome to just drop in, discuss the book. It's from 7.30 to 9, the third Thursday. On the second Thursday of the month, we have just added a history book group. And Sandy and Jim Foreman are going to run that because they're big history buffs and they really were determined to do this. And I'm really excited about it. Their first book is going to be The Wright Brothers by David McCullough. And the second book is going to be Valiant Ambition by Nathaniel Philbrick. And then I think what they're going to do is mine the feelings of the people in the book group and see what they want to do. Whether they want to go with a particular kind of history, whether they want to switch it up. I had suggested How the Irish Saved Civilization by, uh, I think it's Thomas Cahill, which I think is a fascinating history book. So there's some standards and there's some new ones, and I think that they're just going to switch it up. I always like to make sure, no matter what book group we have, that it's gone to paper. Uh, that has seldom presented a problem. Once in a while, the book doesn't go to paper as it says it's going to, so I schedule way ahead, and then it stays in hardcover. So I'm completely fine with people going to the library and finding the book there. They don't have to buy it from me, but I would prefer them not buy it from Amazon, just because I think that that's a thoughtful thing to do. <laughs> Can people buy ebooks from you? Absolutely. On our website, if you look straight at the website on the right hand column, you'll see buy online and it's a box that has two little birdies in it. And you can go in and you can buy CDs, DVDs, ebooks, order your books for delivery. It's the same delivery service that we have for our regular books. And all of them are delivered to your house and all of them are 20% off and 99 cents a piece shipping. We have a separate service called Libro FM that is our digital downloads. And we just added that about three months ago. And you can get the first one, I think, for 99 cents. You can convert some of your audibles over. If you listen a lot, it's a great, great service at $14.99 a month. So, and then you just get anything you want. And they have quite a library and it goes to any format. It works on any device. Uh, and I really like it. There's, you know, I've had to make a couple trips where I always want to have an ebook in the car. There are a lot of people who love to read, and they always say, when I retire, I'm going to open a bookstore. Mm. What advice can you give to the dreamers who think of the paradise of owning a bookstore where they can just sit around and read all day and talk to other people who love books? And I love that that's a myth out there. It's just a wonderful, wonderful visual. And if they're happy thinking about that, they can. My suggestion is that they spend a couple of weeks either volunteering or interning in a bookstore just to see what it's like or go out and get a job in a bookstore 
and see that there is a lot of background that has to happen in order to make a bookstore succeed. Um, the owner specifically has to do, in my case, payroll, rent, bills, budgets, uh, balance of inventory, arranging all of the events, or publicizing all of the events. And I'm little, so there is no staff to farm this out to. All the accounting, as I said before, and then reading in order to book by and meeting with reps. And so people that drop in to speak to me, often it doesn't work out because my day is so heavily scheduled. I spent hours yesterday on the phone with reps. And often on Mondays, which when which is the day that we're closed, I will do my buying on Monday so that I have a clear head and I don't overorder because then you have to pay to return the stuff that you don't sell. We can return overstocks and inventory within a certain time frame, but you're paying shipping and books are heavy. So that's not an easy thing to do. It's not, it's not fail safe. There are classes through the American Booksellers Association. So if you're considering opening a bookstore, I would join the American Booksellers Association and they have a whole digital classroom on there for new and established booksellers and I take full advantage of it all the time. There's conferences in the Northeast. A division of ABA is the New England Independent Booksellers Association and all of us meet together in September for about three days. We take classes, workshops, do a lot of our the finalization of our holiday buying then and we're very collegial. If someone comes to me and wants me to be a book vendor for an event in New Milford, I tell them the Bank Street Book Nook is the bookstore they should go to because Vanessa will take care of them. We don't step on each other's toes. We really want each other to succeed. And it's, it is a trade that has such tremendous culture and such tremendous value. It is a wonderful thing to get involved in, but go in with your eyes opened. If you've never done book buying before, it's worthy of getting an education to do that before you do because it's much more subtle than people would realize. Like any business, it has its real culture and its subtlety that is tremendous. It's wonderful. If you were speaking to an entrepreneur who is thinking opening a business in Bethel, what advice would you give them? absolutely open a business in Bethel. Bethel is a wonderful community. It is a great town. As evidence, we just recently had a fire downtown. The entire community, what can I do? They helped with social services. They called the local church that was helping. They donated items. It's just, it is a terrific place to have a business. Retail, it's a little tougher in the downtown because it's a destination downtown, but there are ways that it has become successful for those of us who have really sort of found a niche and we work cooperatively. There's two business districts. One is Route 6 and one is downtown. Those are sort of the nicknames for both of them. I like the downtown, but the downtown tends to be festival driven. When there's big festivals, we do wildly well. And when we have big events, we do wildly well. And then there's slow times in between. And so you catch a different rhythm. Out on Route 6, you have access to the highway, you have access to other towns, and it's just a different business culture. Either one, depending on the kind of business you're opening, has its merits. It depends on the kind, of, if it's retail. If it's just a regular business, then you just would go to the Chamber of Commerce or the Economic Development Director, Janice Christianich, mm -hmm. and talk to her about it and find out, you know, where the places are. Do you need to go to Francis J. Clark Industrial Park. But Bethel is a wonderful community with a huge variety of businesses, so it's definitely worth it. And how can people find you? Uh, Birds Books is on the web. It's B-Y-R-D-S-B-O-O-K-S dot com. Uh, you can email us at info at birdsbooks dot com. Bird is my middle name, B-Y-R-D, mm -hmm. which is thus the name. The telephone number is 203-730-2973. And we're open any day but Monday. And then from Thanksgiving to the first of the year, we're open every day. What's your address? 126 Greenwood Avenue in downtown Bethel, Caddy Corner, across from P.T. Barnum Square. And we share an entrance with Verizon and have plenty of parking behind our business in the English Apothecary parking lot. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I really appreciate it. I'd do anything to make sure that people know about downtown Bethel. Thank you for listening to the Bethel Business Podcast. 
For more information about the Bethel Chamber of Commerce, call 203-743-6500 or visit discoverbethelct.com. If you run a business in the Bethel area and are interested in being a guest on this podcast, contact Smith Douglas Associates at 203-628-2606.